And so if you look at India's legislation in the last five, six years, uh, for instance, we now have a right to information. And a lot of the social policy is strongly grounded in the discussion on discourse on rights. So the right to information enacted in 2005 it may, may, means that any citizen of this country can file a request to obtain information and there is an information officer who has to give it within 30 days. If not, that officer is personally fined. It's changed the way it, uh, citizens are looking at governance <coughs> in a remarkable manner, remarkable impact it has had. Very ordinary people can file a petition, it costs virtually nothing, and get some information about what is happening to state spending. Where is the money going? What did you promise to do last year? Have you done it? So the accountability that is derived from the right to information has been fantastic. We have another legislation that guarantees employment of 100 days to poor households. It's a right. No one who goes from a poor household and says, listen, I need work can be denied work. It's the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, again framed in a rights uh, framework. But what is distinct about the uh, Employment Guarantee Act are the clauses to ensure better governance and accountability. Social audit, which means it's an audit by people of the functioning of the program, is mandatory. So every anyone can now, in fact, the government is also actively encouraging social audits. Groups of people can go into a village, ask for the accounts, call a public meeting, and ask people, were you paid the wages that you were assured? You were supposed to get 100 days of work. Are you getting it? Did, were you offered a job when you went to get, ask for it? And so it's making a huge difference in the way things are happening. The right to education. You know, India, uh, when, the, when the Constitution was framed in 1950, the argument was made that uh, you know, education was not a fundamental right. Uh, because the government then said, we do not have the financial resources uh, to ensure. India's population in 1950 was about 350 or 360 million. Now, of course, we're over a billion. But in those days also, the government said, we don't have the financial resources, so give us 10 years. And within 10 years, we'll progressively see that all children are in school. 1960 came, 1970 came, 1980 came, 1990 came. The same argument, we don't have the financial resources. We don't have the financial resources. And in the meantime, what were you seeing? India was becoming an absolutely top-rate uh, country for higher education. I mean, the Indian Institutes of Technology, the IITs are very well known. The Indian Institutes of Management, the IIMs. You know, I, am, I studied in IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, they were fantastic institutions. They put out the best managers who are now all over the world doing exceptionally well. So when you look at these kinds of higher institutions, India did very well. But the neglect of basic education and schooling was unforgivable. And it, and it took the civil society movement, the right to education movement, years, years, years of pushing and pushing and pushing until the, it was made a fundamental right in the middle of in 2003. What was the argument even then? Last year, only starting this year, the government has made the financial allocations. All the time they kept saying, where is the money going to come from? And this is a fundamental question. Where does India get the financial resources to ensure that all children get good quality education, that every Indian has access to health care? It's a basic question. And many times in, you know, in these policy meetings that I'm sitting on, I'm on several of these government committees and councils. Uh, one of them is headed by Sonia Gandhi herself, where we are now trying to generate uh, social policy and social legislation to ensure balanced development the resource question comes up all the time. And what is the answer you give? There are two ways of looking at it. One is to ask the question, can India afford these high levels of investment in basic health and education? But a more crit fundamental way of posing the question today is can India afford not to invest in basic health, basic education, basic nutrition, and these essentials of life? Because a lot of the problems that you see in India today are rooted in this basic uh, neglect of the essentials of life. So the question has to be asked, can India afford not to invest? Then how do you answer the question, where will the money come from? 
Now, you know, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh is one of the most eminent economists. He has been the finance minister. He has been the governor of the Central Bank of India. He has been the, he's now the prime minister of this country. I mean, if he does not know where the resources can come from as an economist, none of us can answer that question. But fundamentally, what is behind the question? That it is not a question of money. It is a question of political priorities. For a country like India, investing in health, investing in education, investing in the social sectors is a political question. And it has to be debated in, in Parliament. And so why hasn't India given uh, priority to these uh, is, is a matter of political commitment. And so the resource question is again, like I was saying, it has got an economic dimension, which is a very simple technical dimension. You have or you don't have money, and there are 100 ways of uh, mobilizing resources, which our Prime Minister very well knows. And many eminent economists in India will tell you 10 ways of 100 ways of raising the money. But is the political commitment there to say that this is the priority for this country, that the sustenance of economic growth, that the desire of India to become a prominent player in the, world's, in the world tomorrow will depend how well we address these basic deprivations in the lives of millions of Indians. Uh, the comparison with China is always important and interesting. But the comparison is always on the economic growth rate. You know, is China grow, India is growing at 8.6, is China more or less, and can India catch up with the China in terms of economic growth rates? I feel that is a very futile uh, race. In terms of per capita income, China's per capita income is three times that of India's. So in terms of per capita income, we are never going to be catching up with China so quickly. But can we match China in terms of what the old Chinese system achieved in terms of uh, health, education? They have universal schooling. Almost every Chinese, all, all Chinese men and women and children read and write. According to the last census, 300 million Indians could not read and write, of which 200 million were women. Uh, the infant mortality rate is, is half of that reported by India. India has a child malnutrition rate of 45%. That's twice the levels of children in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa reports an undernutrition rate of 20 to 30%. If you look at Indian states, we're reporting 20 to 60%. The average is 45% of children under 5 are underweight. So why is this happening? Is it because India doesn't have resources? Is it a shortage of food? No. If you look at the per capita income of many African countries and look at the per capita of income of India and the growth record, India is much better. In this very region, Bangladesh, a country which is growing less faster than uh, India and has a lower per capita income, has an infant mortality rate lower than India's. What is happening in Bangladesh? It's a poor country. Uh, but their living conditions have seem to be, at least in terms of girls' education, in terms of nutrition, in terms of infant mortality, it's doing better than India. So this constant question, and that is what is the power of the MDGs, we started with the MDGs, you have to constantly, constantly go after this question. And the point you started by asking, why don't we look at these issues together? What is the role of the media? How do you communicate the importance of these uh, other sectors, not just focus on growth, but bring that linkage of growth to an expansion of opportunities and an assurance of human rights, improvements in human security, improvements in standards of living? Why is that gap not there? And so I think the fundamental discourse today in development, uh, you know, I was involved in the human development reports from 1990 to 2000, and I continue to uh, work in this area of human development, uh, the fundamental question is how do we strengthen the public dialogue and the public discourse in countries like India and other countries that are enjoying economic progress to say what are the missing linkages between economic prosperity and definite improvements in the lives of people. Now I also teach at the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad and there are about 560 of the brightest uh, young business school students there. And the course I teach is on government, society, and business. And I must tell you that they're very bright students. Uh, and But they have never engaged. They are now 
for this. It's a one-year program. It's in the top 20 schools in the Financial Times global ranking and so on. It's done very well in the last 10 years. They, by the time they graduate, these uh, ed education will ensure that they're fantastic in financial management, marketing, and investment banking, and whatnot. But the dialogue over there on the kinds of issues that I'm talking about was non-existent. And the school figured that if you want to really make business leaders who are five years or seven years of graduating from this Indian School of Business will be shaping uh, Indian policy, they have to get a very strong grounding in the other dimensions, not just in financial management and the marketing and sales promotion and uh, those are important. But how do, how do business leaders see India's progress? How can you be so narrow-minded? So the course that I teach, I stimulate thinking and I keep asking these students, why do you think this is happening? And interestingly, they will tell you, and in fact, uh, this is a, uh, when you ask them, uh, why do you think, uh, what is the biggest problem? Uh, they will say population. And I'm amazed that uh, people think that population is, a, is India's biggest problem, because there is such good news on the population front. Our fertility rates are declining. By the way, I know that Italy has the other kind of problem, where the fertility <laughs> rates are down to 1.4. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are struggling major to... Problem. Yeah, it's a major <laughs> problem. But, but India faces the other kind of problem. Our fertility rate is about 2.3 or 2.4 now, which is, it has to come down to 2, is what the demographers tell you. And there's a, they say that, oh, we have, we have, you know, we have remained a poor country, uh, the standards of living are low because of large population. And I say that's absolutely wrong. You know, look at China. You know, the, you can't compare it with us with any other country because China has a, a population of 1.2 billion people. And in terms of these basics of life, whether it's health, education, nutrition, water, sanitation, housing, they're much superior to us. And they achieved it when their levels of income were as low as India's is. So the compa it's not about growth rates. If you look at the top 10 most populous countries of the world, that includes the United States, India and China are growing much more rapidly. So it has not, nothing to do with growth rates, it's nothing to do with population size. It has to do with the fact that Indian, India has not recognized that the real strength is its people. And that unless you look after people, you will continue to, continue to be in the experience the kinds of problems we are. 